Okay, welcome to our Empathy Cafe. This is our cafe talking, we're exploring the topic of uh, what are the values of a culture of empathy or whatever is alive for you. And uh, so we're gonna just start off with a quick introduction, just your name and where you're located. And uh, before we go into our circles, which I know everyone here has knows the process, so we don't have to go into explaining how that works. So Bill, do you wanna start? Sure, uh, Bill Filler here in the San Francisco, smoky San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I'm Edwin Rutsch in the, uh, also in the smoky San Francisco mm -hmm. Bay Area, and Sophia? I'm Sophia and I live in Sweden. Oh, great, and uh, Maureen? I'm Maureen and I am in Ireland, wet and raining. <laughs> and Claudine? Fresh. Fresh. Um, yeah. I'm in Apocalypseville here in Oakland, yeah. <laughs> California. At least today we can see marginally better, but the air quality is <clears throat> terrible. And James, thanks, James. Uh, hi, I'm Lucifer and I rule in hell. I mean, I'm James and I'm in New York. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Very good. Uh, uh, yes, Ipsan. Ipsan. Ipsan, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I'm currently in UK. Oh, great. And Sarah? Yeah. Hi, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area. Okay, great. Um, I guess that's everyone. So everyone here is familiar with the empathy circle process. So I'm just making the groups right now. Maureen, can you uh, facilitate one? Okay. Okay. And uh, so I'll facilitate the other one. So we're ready to go into it. The topic is what are the values of a culture of empathy and uh, just anything else that's alive for you? Um, yep, so we'll go into those circles. Here we go. And I'm opening all the rooms and here we see you there. Okay, let me just get these breakout rooms set up here just so I can monitor it. Okay, everyone knows the uh, process, so uh, let's get started. And who, who can keep time? Does someone want to keep the time? Yes, okay, James. Who would like to start? I'm happy to start. Okay. Um, I'll speak to you, Edwin. Listening. Ah, what a nice surprise. Um, yeah, let me try to stick to the suggested topic. Um, values of a culture of empathy. Um, I'm going to name a value that I think is probably uh, may sound unusual. Uh, he heroism, heroism. I think that to, um, to actually engage and live up to the values of nonviolence is a heroic act. Okay, so you're, you're surprised or <coughs> pleasantly surprised and you're going to stick to the topic, uh, which is the values of a culture of empathy and you're, the, uh, the value that you're thinking of is heroism, which is to really stay, is the sort of the act of staying uh, with the values of a culture of empathy. Yeah. And I want to say that I think it's even a heroic act for, um, for Bill to, to want to be here with me in an empathy circle, because I know that he has had some hesitancy to, to doing that. And, and so, yeah, I want to name that I appreciate it. I, I don't think that it's easy. Yeah, you're appreciating, you want to name that you appreciate Bill being here in this empathy circle with you because you you're realize it's not easy for him. It's a, I mean, it's a guess. I don't know what's going on for Bill, but I do think it might be uh, difficult. And um, 
it's, it's not so difficult for me to be here right now, but it is difficult for me to show up to places with people that I'm in conflict with. Yeah, uh, it's uh, <coughs> difficult for you to show up in places that uh, where you're in conflict with the people. So there's a, it's a challenge. Difficulty. Yes, yes. Mm, I, I just came from a call, a group, an Extinction Rebellion call with Mickey Kashtan. And I listened to Mickey Kashtan talk for, you know, an hour. I silently listened. And then I said, all I said was, is it okay for me to bring in a different opinion about what's being said? I just, I have a different way of seeing things. And the group leader said, no. He said, this is not the place to disagree with Mickey. Yeah, so maybe you're feeling some frustration because you were in a call, Extinction Rebellion call with Mickey Kashtan. She talked for an hour and you even just raised your hand to ask if you could, uh, you asked for permission if you could talk about a different topic and they said no, kind of shut you down. Well, I didn't ask, I, I was actually clear, I didn't ask to talk about a different topic. I said that Mickey has been talking about roles and power and flow and that I had a difference in opinion about what Mickey had promoted what she believed. And I wanted to know if it was okay, if I could s express a different way of seeing things than Mickey without being shouted down or removed from the call. And they were very clear. They said, no, you can't. Mm, so it was, you were just, it was the same topic, but just a different perspective on that topic. And you asked if you could ask, you know, mention something, say something different. And they were very clear. The answer was no, you couldn't. Yeah. And so then I'm wondering what's the point of being there? Because it's clearly, it's not just structurally, it's not just me, but nobody can express a different opinion. It, they didn't say, well, no, you James are special. They said, no, this is a space to listen to Mickey. That's terrifying to me. What if, what if Mickey was saying something that is wrong? Yeah, so it's kind of terrifying to you. And it's like you're just really frustrated and kind of angry about it because what if she's saying something that's wrong and then nobody can say anything in response? Yes. So um, for me, that you know gives preference to this structure hands down. I don't care if I'm in a room you know, with Jesus Christ or Albert Einstein, I don't care how smart the person is. If it's a structure where only they can say whatever they want and we cannot ever disagree, that is, that is how Nazism is born. That, that is the scariest structure I can imagine. Yeah, so you really appreciate this structure because everybody has, has a voice. And if you're in a structure where it doesn't matter who it is, it can be Jesus or anyone that's important. But if other people can't speak and it's only them, that's like leads to sort of a Nazism, authoritarianism. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thank you. I feel fully heard. Okay, well, I'll speak to uh, Bill. Um, Listening? Yeah, I mean, I, I the. And uh, we're going to go for an ultrasound, and then there's a video showing the arrest. And the woman's like, what did I do wrong? And it's, there's actually, a, with their shelter in place, state of emergency. There's some kind of stipulation, and so they cannot go against whatever is the state position. Oh, so she was um, she was pregnant, and then she was, I guess, arrested, and uh, and the reason was because you can't even say that you're against whatever the state uh, position. I assume it is on the coronavirus and healthcare. Mm -hmm. social distancing mm -hmm. and the impact on the economy yeah mm -hmm. so that was not something that was communicated to me mm -hmm. in advance by my sister mm -hmm. and I shared a post a social mm -hmm. media post and then she blocked me well from being able to do that in the future without letting me know because I, I shared about the Oregon protest mm -hmm. and about a professor who got injured Mm. And I tagged her. Now I can't tag my sister ever again, but there wasn't a discussion about, please don't do this. There's a law. Okay. So you, there was no um, discussion or your sister wasn't able to tell why, tell you or inform you why she was um, po posting it publicly was um, so difficult for her. And that um, you, uh, and then you had tagged her and she kind of blocked you. 
And so you um, posted this thing about a professor who had gotten hurt in, in Portland and she won't hear it. So it seems to be um, kind of like there, there, there's not adequate communication. Somehow she did get to you what the problem was, but she, I guess, didn't engage with you um, right. about a resolution. She didn't engage with me. And, but I found out later the reason why, because ah. of the woman being arrested in, in ah. um, the state of Victoria, which is, mm. has a severe, so, so I'm, I'm looking, so I'm looking at people are coming from different places and I didn't know that about my sister. Um, and yeah, so I'm, yeah, to her, so the confidentiality thing, she's really big on that. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did not know, um, that there were laws. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and I'm just looking back at what was shared earlier. That was, it was really powerful. And I'm just looking, I took notes. Um, sure. so for me, um, I appreciate that the short shares because I'm more visual. And so because I'm visual, which I can't find my notes now, I'm not going to retain as well as I wish. I don't have a photographic memory and mm -hmm. I prefer to have really great retention. So, but I wanted to see, I love the idea, the value of taking care of each other and working together um, and then looking at everyone's weaknesses and strengths. So, it, so as an educator, I know that everyone has different learning styles mm -hmm. and different perspectives. Um, so I'm pretty aware of that. And I think it's really important to hold that space. Okay. So that was uh, quite a bit. Um, let's see if I can organize my thoughts here. And so basically you were talking about, you like the idea of taking care of people and supporting people, you know, celebrating their strengths, supporting their weaknesses. And you're taking notes and you wish to do that because these are rich ideas that you wish to flesh out and continue with. And I don't feel I really gave you justice but rather than guess, is there anything else that I missed or that was very important that you needed um, to say? Briefly, think, because your time is up. Now. I think that's, that's, I'd like to, I'd like to hear more. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about, the, um, you know, how to work with everyone's weakness and strengths in, in positive right. ways yeah. and that everyone grows at their own pace and how, right. how to create a safe safety for everybody in that context. Okay, so you're looking to say how to um, create a mutually supportive uh, an environment wherever you are. Exactly, mutually supportive. Thank you. I feel very hurt. Sure. Okay. Um, James, you listen to me. Listening. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, I think that that's a that's a good thing. This whole public private thing. Um, you know, I do think there's a time for confidentiality um, and there's, and, and then also um, certainly we've all heard about backroom deals and things like that, that we don't feel are, are great. And I think that that's a, an issue to discuss. And then to me, there's not a one size fits all. It's not like let's make everything public or let's make everything private, but there needs to be in order I'm sorry, this is, I'm kind of getting <laughs> in the weeds here. So stop me if you need to, James. Um, you, want and, to, you want me to get that? Yeah, first? sure. Why okay. don't we do that? I think that would be better. Sure. So um, you're thinking about the public-private um, issue that Sarah was raising and the concerns mm -hmm. and how the, there's not a one-size-fits-all answer. Mm -hmm. You see value in both at times. Right. And then the key to that is communication. The key is, is really communication. And it was so important in my job, again, as a special education teacher, where I was dealing with, and, but also working in hospitals uh, with suicidal adolescents and, and people like, you know, kids like that. Um, you really needed to have good communication, both between the staff and then also with your students or patients. I'll stop there. Communication. So the, the, the component that allows negotiating the private public mm -hmm. dichotomy is good communication. Right. Uh, yeah, and, and well, you, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you said you gave the example that it was relevant in the schools regarding people's uh, private history, uh, you know, personal medical issues. They were needed to be kept private, but maybe some of that information was still public anyway. 
Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it kind of got into, the, yeah, it's difficulty. You really have to take your time to communicate, listen to people, and find out, you know, what people's boundaries are and things like that. I'll stop there. You communicate with people and you find out what each individual's personal boundaries are as a way of just building the mm -hmm. trust or right. the system. Yeah. And while I also, you know, in, in, you know, this is the whole issue about, you know, how much do we regulate behavior in a culture of empathy and how much do we not regulate any sort of behavior in a culture of empathy. Um, and I just think that there needs to be, um, if we, uh, rather than say, it needs to be an atmosphere where people feel that they will be heard. And I'll stop there. So there's a question about, Regul like how, how much of a place does regulation have within a culture mm. of empathy? And uh, mm. it's essential that the spaces be places where people can be heard. That's an essential. Right. And that which, that, that's different with different individuals at different times of days and things like that. Mm. It, and that's why communication is so essential. And then I'm done. Thank you. So the thing which facilitates it actually being a space where people feel that they can be heard is that their voice about that space matters mm. and is uh, a part of what creating that space. Yeah, there needs to be some trust that they will be heard. There needs to be some trust that they will be heard in that space. Yeah. Thanks, James. I feel fully heard. Sure. Um, I'd like to speak back to you, Bill. Could you listen to me? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the navigation of po private public is, has been one of the most trickiest ones for me to uh, navigate. And um, I have had, yeah, I've, I continue to learn uh, about this issue. Um, I do agree uh, that there's a, a value in both strategies and also that there's not um, even, they're not two clear distinct strategies. There are gradations of mm -hmm. public and gradations of private. Um, so for example, right, you could have a private Facebook group but act, but it's not as private as the CIA's, you know, notes. It, they're, they're, someone could go in there and share some information outside, but it is different than having a public Facebook group. So considering what is meant by private in each instance is also important. Would you reflect that, please? Oh, sure, absolutely. So in this, uh, this uh, issue of whether something should be public or private is, is uh, an area of ongoing learning and experience for you. And you wanted to make sure, you know, you wanted to point out that there's also such a gray area. It's not like just a demarcation. So for instance, a private uh, Facebook play, uh, page would be more private than a public Facebook page, but less private than a CIA black ops. Um, yeah, yeah. And so they're, they're all those things yeah. that are going on. Yeah. Um, and an issue, I had an issue in a group that I, a call that I organized where um, I tried a new strategy. Previously, I had been making an agreement at the beginning of the call about whether it was private or public. And this time I moved to, we agree at the end of the call a consensus decision at the end of the call. Mm -hmm. And um, I showed up in a way at that call that was embarrassing. It's, it's not at all what I would like to be seen mm -hmm. as showing up as. Mm -hmm. And I sat with the decision for a day. I had, mm -hmm. I had organized the call, so the recording, I had the recording, but I, and I sat, you know, with this decision, do I, publish it and just show my failure mm. to show up in the way I want? Or do I present an edited version of myself mm -hmm. to this group? Mm. And I see value in both of those. And I, cho I chose to, I chose to publish it. 
because mm -hmm. I see the I, I I really see the value in being transparent, but it's not something that I would want to force on someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were in a group and um, you you decided to approach it uh, in in a particularly different way as about the public or private, and it would be consensus decision at the end of the call, I assume, and that is that correct? Okay. Yes. And then uh, and then. You and then you had the recording, and then when you recorded, it, you felt that you were not at your best and didn't really reflect. And the question is, do you, you know, uh, present a sanitized view or an idealized view, or you know, everything with warts and all? And you decide to go ahead with warts and all um, because of transparency, but nevertheless, you can see the the possibility where maybe an edit to, in some circumstances an edited call would would be preferable. Yeah. And I also see that if I had kept it private, um, how do I say this? It, that there, there is um, the way I might post it to a private group, it is possible for other people to share. And so I'm wondering as the person organizing the call, how much responsibility do I have to mm. maintain and protect people's confidentiality if I'm telling them I've made it a private call. And, and so th there's clearly work. I, I agree it's about communication. There's work to be done to let people know what I mean by private if I tell them I'm keeping it private. So the question was, is like, again, there's this issue of, um, of degree and um, you had, you know, you said it was a private call, but then somebody could have, uh, you know, recorded or taken a screenshot and shared it. And so the question is how much control, how much responsibility do you have? Uh, and, and it seems that you've come, um, what you could do is to be as clear as possible about what the parameters around it, uh, yes. public or private would be. Yeah, that's my time. Thank you, Bill. Okay, sure, welcome. Okay. Uh, let's see, Ed? I'm listening. Okay. Um, so, hmm, yeah, public and private. Um, it being a special education teacher, there are still some things that I can't share uh, about my students, uh, even good things that I just can't share. I'll stop there for now. Yeah, you're going back to the topic of public or private and, you know, as a teacher, there are certain things you can't share about your students. Right, because I took a, 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 you know, an oath of confidentiality, even though um, the students are, well, these, you know, students are doing well, they've actually been very open about their situation and they've actually been, you know, leaders um, in, um, communicating forthrightly about their condition. So uh, even though they're these students are like leaders and have been open and but you you can't talk about them because I think there's probably some kind of an agreement that you've made as a teacher some kind of confidentiality agreement. We all made a, what I consider a very sacred agreement to keep um, their uh, private life private um, because that would reflect um, adversely uh, on their future prospects in the world. That's the reason for that. I'll stop there. Yeah, you made this uh, agreement, which you hold sacred, because it might affect uh, them in, in, their, in, in their lives mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah. Yeah. And on the other hand, you know, I um, like, and I won't be using names, but there's a student who um, had uh, Asperger's who now has his own podcast and, and blog where he talks about that very freely and, um, and then talks with other people, you know, about the issue of living with Asperger's in, in society. So uh, one of those students says have a podcast, they're open, they're sort of transparent about it. Mm -hmm. And so he's very open, but you have, I guess you're referring that you can't talk about him because you well, made can't, an, name him, right. can't name him because you right. yeah. kind of I'd made love, an agreement. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd love to turn you on to his podcast, you know, uh, but, um, but I can't. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, but he did call me because um, we are friends uh, and uh, to check in on me, which was really touching. 
really touching. And, uh, and then I could tell him how proud I am of him. Uh, and then also to give him a little love to his family because he had a great family to work with. It was very, very difficult for them and for us. And we, um, we wrote it out and he came out the other side. I'll stop there. So you're just very moved because he actually reached out and, you know, contacted you. And it sounds like, you know, just had maybe some appreciation and you were just very touched uh, by that uh, connection. And it was a difficult uh, journey because it sounds like he went through a lot and his family was there for him. You were there for him and he came out kind of on, in, a, in a good way. Yeah. Um, and that's what I think that, you know, and then that gets me back to the issue of communication and how important it is to really ask that extra question and listen and try to um, take in, in the spirit of empathy, what the person's situation is and, um, you know, and at the very least factor it into your um, position, whatever, sorry. So you're just seeing the importance of empathy, really trying to understand people where they're, where they're coming from and factor in, you know, their circumstance into your, yeah. into your understanding and views and actions, I guess. Right. And I think that empathy, you have once said that this, you know, circle is an action. People say it's just talk. And I agree with that, but sometimes we need to take it a step further. And that it's not, it, it's not a, you know, it's not a magical thing. Um, you know, certain times you need to um, take it a step further and listen more, act more and things like that because the universe is a big place and the empathy circle is a wonderful tool, but it's not as big as the universe. I'll stop there. So there's, you know, things that need to be done outside of the empathy circle. It's a good tool, mm -hmm. but there's other things that we need to do outside of the circle. Yeah. And I'd even go as far as to say a wonderful tool, a wonderful, <laughs> versatile tool. And I'm done. Thank yeah. You. So you're really seeing the phrases of the empathy <laughs> circle. It's a wonderful tool. And, yes. I uh, just want to really iterate, yeah, emphasize that. Sure. Um, okay. Well, I'll speak to uh, Sarah then. I'm listening. Um, yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, the confidentiality and openness, you know, I guess that's a, uh, it seems, that that seems to be the topic that's come up here. So I see a culture of empathy is, you know, you try to make a more and more open culture, more open and transparent. Uh, but I do understand if people, you know, need to want uh, confidentiality too. That's like, you know, I don't want to force anyone to be open if they're not ready to. So you're seeing a theme emerge in this breakout room regarding openness versus confidentiality. And you, you're relaying that the culture of empathy values openness, but there are times when people may prefer confidentiality. Yeah, I mean, if you're in an authoritarian country, you know, you could be, your life could be at stake, you know, for, so, uh, but also by being fearful and closed, it also reinforces the fear. Like it's used in these countries like Belarus or whatever, it's when people stop being afraid and they come out in public and say what they're thinking that, you know, dictators can, can sort of be toppled or, you know, so there is, and that's why democracies are, you know, talk so much about openness and transparency because a democracy really needs that, the, you know, needs that openness. So what's really emerging is the idea of de democracy on a national political level where, where transparency, so sorry, transparency can topple dictatorships. <coughs> dictatorships are predicated on secrecy. So you're definitely weighing the times that transparency is very, very valuable um, versus when is it needed for, um, you know, privacy. Yeah, well, it's fear because you're, it's, it's kind of like fear of, uh, you know, you're afraid that you're going to be harmed by sharing, right, in some way or another. So it is, you know, authoritarianism sort of thrives under fear 
It's like people are afraid to go against whoever the boss is. <laughs> so I guess that's one aspect. Mm, you're sharing about a world paradigm of um, fear and domination mm -hmm. that authoritarian, authoritarian, authoritarianism thrives on. Yeah. And so, but I have understanding for that too. You know, I don't tell everything, you know, that I'm up to, but I, <laughs> I got things I don't share. <laughs> so, so, and I, I appreciate that, but I'm not going to shut down somebody else and unfriend them for being open and transparent like I was in this other group, this NBC group. Mm, you're sharing that you have. You have the ability to have discretion and monitor what you're going to share, what you're going to make private versus what you're going to be make, making public. And you're really questioning what this other group did. Yeah. So the other point is the, the uh, aspect of uh, facing conflict or avoiding conflict. So I know in this group, James kind of railed about, oh, I have conflict with people. And the conflict is, is that people didn't want to be in a circle with him. So that's sort of the, the other issue. And it seems to me that when people sort of avoid the, di the dialogue, the conflict kind of keeps growing. And if, you know, if we kind of come together, have the empathy circle, if everybody sort of follows the practice of the empathy circle, it can, un it's better to face it and then just to be there in the circle, you know, it might be some discomfort, uh, but then to, in, in it, then it kind of helps get rid of the fear. It's, I'm just noticing that it's the distance that kind of creates a lot of anxiety and fear and anger and stuff. Mm. So you're diving deep into how people respond, avoidance patterns regarding mm, conflict. Yep. And you're diving deep in what are the strategies of moving past that and resolving the situation? Yeah, exactly. The avoidance is a good term. There's, there's what is there? Avoidance, right? Is flight, then there's fight, and then there's freeze, and then there's empathy. So I see four responses to fear, and and the one that never gets talked about is empathy. It's like it's like fight, fight, f f fear, or freeze, but nobody talks about. Hey, you know, one response is the empathic response, and I see the empathy circle as a framework for that empathic response. You know, you kind of bring yeah, probably my time. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're exploring this further about um, people's avoidance strategies of fight, flight, freeze, um, and looking at empathy cafes and empathy practice as a way of moving through our avoidance strategies. And fear and of freezing, okay. yeah. Freezing. It's, it's another option to fear. Mm -hmm. Just, just reflect that last part, I'll feel heard. Okay, yes. So for people to, so Empathy Cafes also help move through fear and freezing and fight and flight so people can be heard. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm going to go to Bill. Okay, listening. Okay, so... Hmm, really sitting with what and when shared. So, um, re recently at my job, um, we had to, we had to have some very difficult conversations with some colleagues and we could not be, one of my colleagues was doing avoidance and not even communicating and not touching an issue where there was conflict. So we had to not burn bridges because if I was direct, I would have been very offensive. Mm -hmm. If I actually said exactly what was on my mind, like basically there was a laundry list of that colleague doing X, Y, Z, which was not okay. But I had to phrase it in a certain way. And, the fr and I had to do this, hey, I'm curious. I noticed we weren't on the same page. And I'm curious, you know, maybe what was happening for you? Do you want to speak about that? Or, um, you know, and I, I don't, I mean this in just a, in a way of moving forward and I hope you're not going to take offense. And just because I, I hope we can work together better. 
So you had an issue where there was a difficult, there was a conflict at work or there's a difficult issue and you had to talk with this colleague about these difficult issues. And you knew that if you just kind of, you know, stated what you felt plainly that that would be, you know, you'd be a defensive reaction and things like that. And that, so you had to employ um, certain other ways to kind of soften your approach. Um, so, and then also invite the other person in to talk, not just to be lectured to, so that they could, um, so that hopefully you could find some common ground. Yes, and it was not easy because it's a new language. This isn't just mm. empathy. This is an at language of asking people questions. Uh, you know, I'm curious, like, I'm curious. I noticed maybe we weren't on the same page. Do, do you want to mm. share what happened? <sighs> As opposed to, I wanted just to come out and say, and do blame shame. Mm -hmm. wanted just to say you did this wrong you did that wrong i'm not okay mm -hmm. and i couldn't i couldn't do that it would have done more damage mm -hmm. than good yeah so again to kind of recapitulate um you uh were in this situation and you really were in the kind of blame and shame uh possibly you felt hurt yourself by some actions that the person did and, uh, but maybe not, maybe I'm reading into that too much. Um, and then, um, but nevertheless, you had to um, really filter and modify your presentation so that the other person could hear it and not get into their own fear or fear or blame shame space I, in order to hear you. And it was not easy for me because basically, I basically could have been very transparent. It would have been so easy for me to be transparent and say to this person, you know what, like, why were you late to the interview? Like, 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 hey, why did you bypass our agreement? You know, like what, you know, and there was a lot of, or I would say, hey, I understand you're moving. I understand, you know, there's some challenges right now. I mean, I had to soften it, but honestly, it was really hard, but I knew, uh, and then that person still took offense. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, and just didn't communicate back. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there was, there was a problem um, with, we had different ideas regarding leadership. And, you know, and so definitely this person was, was direct at times and passive aggressive others. And it was just not okay. And said the most tactless things in the interview. I was like, and I was like, oh my God, is she trying to sabotage our new hire? Because she's so tactless and is scaring this person. You know, mm -hmm. she said the opposite of what you say to someone, you don't do scare fear mm -hmm. tactics to with a new hire. So, but I couldn't come out and say that directly. And it's so hard. So I, I see a new thing of like, when you're in conflict with someone, what are the things you can do to broach that conflict without scaring them off? Maybe asking questions or you know, hey, if I have a conflict with another member in the circle, for example, like I've witnessed dynamics between others, like how is that can be best, like something ahead of time How for all of us, how can we, you know, best move forward if we have something that is a conflict? That, that, so okay. that, that should be, I think that should be addressed. So you were talking about, um... mm -hmm. You know, this, this issue with this, it was a coworker, and there was a, a new employer, employee rather in the interview, and they had, they had stepped over the line and done things that you just would not do for a new employee that were kind of scary and was, you know, very, um, you know, no filter and no, um, and no consideration for the person who's listening to them. And that when you tried to you know, broach the subject, even though um, diplomatically, they still took offense. And so you're still struggling with, okay, well, I tried to do that. And then, so how do we sort this out? How do I, you know, um, get my point across, still feel heard and, you know, uphold this value without, um, but while still uh, engaging this person? Right, right. So my, my thought is asking questions like, Hey, it does help, does help. And so when I did half the time, she actually did soften and say, hey, you're a real good person, thank you. You know, like, you know, I said, hey, I'm imagining you're really going through a tough time, but you know, 
hey, do, do you want to just talk? And, you know, like there to be some ease and peace between the two of us, mm -hmm. you know, asking some questions, but not blaming that other person. Mm -hmm. And trust me, like that other person was, I mean, and avoidance too is horrible. Like to not reply, she just stopped replying and we had to move forward on time sensitive deliverables. And like, that is not workable for me. So, you know, and I had to say a goodbye letter, you know, saying, well, you know, I waited and tried to reach you to no avail. Um, I'm deeply saddened that we didn't have an opportunity to have closure. So we that was the time, just in case you haven't, I've noticed you, were, you weren't seeing the, the, the screen. I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> I'm just so in my thoughts. I don't okay. think that ordinarily. I'm so, so sorry. No, no problem. That's just right. no want to let you know, just a yeah. marker. Yeah. So it's oh. again, it, it, this is a very live subject for you. And, um, and, and there just seems to be gaps in understanding that you still, you're still exploring how to bridge those in the best way. Right. Exactly. Thank okay. you so much, Bill. Sure. All right, James, I'll, if you'll listen to me. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, yeah, um, well, um, we talked about communication and then that's very important. And, uh, you know, uh, I've certainly been in situations similar to what everybody was talking about. Um, and, you know, how important it is, um, there needs to be a certain, I think, a, a baseline respect uh, in order for people to feel heard. And I'll stop there. Um, respect okay. or baseline respect is necessary for people to feel heard. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and to go back, I think that the empathy circle is a, is a wonderful tool, but we live lives that are much broader than that. And so we have to consider behavior sometimes within and without the, the empathy circle. And that doesn't necessarily mean we're responsible, but it needs to be acknowledged. Um, so life exists outside of the empathy circle. And so sometimes it's necessary to consider behavior mm -hmm. outside of the empathy circle. Right, like one of the, one of the um, uh, and this, I, I wanna, this has nothing to do with any conflict we're having. I just wanna make, make sure that this is not directed at you. Um, but, and before I even met you, we had this discussion. What if someone threatened to kill someone in an empathy circle? Are you, you know, do, is, is that an area of exploration or, you know, or is, is that something that just does, shuts down any meaningful communication and things like that? that that's the question. So you want to be clear that this is not about a, any personal conflict between you and me. It's a right. discussion, an issue that has come up before I knew we knew each other, mm. a question that poses, what if someone in an empathy circle said they threatened to kill mm. someone in the empathy circle? Is it then taken as a um, exploration or is that something else? Is that 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 requires action? Right. And um, having been threatened, uh, you know, by my life, it depends, like, for instance, if a student threatened me, um, I had to take, you know, um, which happened, and they would say, I had to take due diligence, like to find out what access they had to weapons, um, you know, but I really wasn't, you know, that afraid. However, certain times, um, their parents, um, who could be just as immature, as them uh, would threaten me. And that was quite another matter. In your role as a teacher, mm -hmm. there were times where people, students threatened mm -hmm. you and you mm -hmm. were required to take due diligence, meaning mm -hmm. checking if they had access to weapons. You, mm -hmm. didn't, th you didn't feel threatened personally, but you, you, you wanted to um, be systematic about how you dealt with it. And sometimes they also came from, the threats also came from parents. Right, which is much more difficult and much more um, threatening. Much yeah. more difficult when it comes from the adults. Yeah. Um, so, um, so 
I really feel that it's not in anyone's best interest um, to hurt another person um, knowingly. And so that's sort of, and I'm kind of stepping back and I don't know if I have the answers here, but then, but that's what I see in a culture of empathy that somehow people sense, like we talked about strengths and weaknesses and that we act, we need to be authentic, but we act not to hurt. Um, you sincerely believe that it's not in anyone's interest to hurt another person. Mm -hmm. And um, within a culture of empathy, mm -hmm. we act in ways which uh, are differently than hurting people. Yeah. Um, and then again, this comes to a, a matter of degree. Um, you know, if you parse your syllables wrong, is, you know, is that, uh, you know, is that, you know, an unforgivable sin or... <laughs> is threatening a per again this is not anything to do with us but just as a philosophical issue um you know or is um you know threatening someone seriously i mean you know those are sort of the two um examples of, of the extremes and that's it that's time and so okay. the, the the you're just raising this question it's almost like a philosophical question yes. about the levels of degree because yeah. it's possible to parse a sentence in a way that could maybe be interpreted as a as a threat of violence mm -hmm. and um i think you said you don't have the answer about some of these mm -hmm. questions about how to um navigate some of these questions around the empathy circles and violence or potential threats. Yeah, and I don't think parsing about violence, but sometimes, you know, the way you say things or just minor things have nothing to do with violence make you persona non grata. And, mm. you know, that, that, that is a concern of mine. Not even violence, mm. but even just um, communication on other more mundane things can alienate people. Yeah. Thanks, James. I feel fully heard. Great. Sarah, would you listen to me? Yeah, I appreciated the story you told before about the coworker and how you were trying to find the best way um, to navigate a conflict with your coworker by both being truthful but diplomatic. Um, And um, yeah, so the, the call that I had with Mickey Kashtan two hours ago, um, I was, do, I was trying to do the same thing and I really failed. I really, really, really failed. Um, I, I went into it with the best of intentions. My plan was to ask the question and, and, and be serious, to have it be a genuine question and where, um, And I didn't, I think I didn't take into account how angry I am. So when I um, received the no, even though I didn't force myself into the group call, I uh, attacked the organizer of the call in, in private. Mm. Okay, so you're definitely reflecting on appreci expressing appreciation, but also the challenge of navigating disagreements with diplomacy and you're reflecting on your call with Mickey Kashtan and you, that you came in with the best of intentions. So when you, when you spoke with her, you did not realize that how shut down you were feeling when they said no and you didn't take into account the anger you felt and it came through. So you feel you may have personally attacked Mickey Constant in private? Well, not Mickey, but the organizer of the call. Oh. So, um, but I'm, but it's easy to predict or understand. I, it's easy to assume that um, my attack on her would alienate me from her and, and that group and not be seen, not be taken graciously. 
Wow. Wow. So you're really, really diving deep. That is really and easy to make this assumption that your response may have had the opposite effect of what you intended and alienated instead of built bridges. Oh, yeah. Um, my difference, the difference I wanted to bring in the call was so minor, but when I was prevented from just disagreeing on a point that Mickey made, I went into total outrage mode and I attacked the organizer of the call. I called her a total fucking moron. Uh, I called her a Nazi. I said she was a cultist. I mean, I just went to town on her. And it had, and that's not what I wanted to bring. That's not the disagreement I wanted to bring in originally. I just wanted to point out that I have like a different view on role relationships and power. So you, you're reflecting on it. Originally what you were pointing out was minor, but the very act, but at the same time, pointing out on role relationships is so important and that it touched this place in you that was so core, not being able to share. Can I correct you? It's not about the role relationships. It's, oh. that, it's, it's that I was being asked to, to, to be totally conformist, that no disagreement whatsoever was permitted. So it was like my whole existence was being, um, was told nothing about you matters. If you have any difference, if you're different than us in any way, we will annihilate it. We will screen it out. All you can do is be Mickey Kashtan. And that, it, that is so terrifying to me that I, you know, went into total survival mode to say, you know, into defiance against that, against the, the individual in the role that was taking responsibility for screening me out. So their, their rules, which were screening you out, they touched this place in you because you were, you were asked to conform and not even have a space for you and in that moment, you felt that you had no existence, that you were feeling annihilated. That was the feeling that you had. Yeah, and I wanna just clarify, that's my time, but I just wanna clarify that it's not true. Like two hours later, I can come out of that spell and see they, they don't, me being in there is not the end all be all of who I am. But in that moment, yeah, I, I, I fell for the spell of thinking that that was my annihilation. Mm, got it, got it. And so in the moment, two, two, two hours later, you had total picture. You definitely saw nothing personal. This was having nothing to do with your identity, your existence, the way you matter in the world. Two hours later, you had that perspective, but in the moment, that was not the frame of mind. So you called her a Nazi and you called her a um, moron, is that correct? Um, and you realized, Two hours later, wait a second. I I I wasn't having the big picture. Yeah, you got me, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Edwin. Listening. Wow. So I'm just really sitting with what Jane shared. It's really powerful. Um, I'm trying not to do any trust talk because I really want to respect that. But I'm, it was just very, very powerful. Um, and I definitely can relate because in the moment, I definitely will like, if, if there's conflict, if someone's done something that's pushed my button, um, it might not even be in the here and the now. It might be from like, you know, it might be a, a button or a trigger from something else, another situation or another 10 situations. And then of course, later I'm like, wait a second, that wasn't anything personal. Um, so it's a trigger that it's a, it's like this global trigger. Um, and then of course, later you're like, you get perspective and you're like, oh wait, that wasn't so bad. What was I thinking? Yeah, so it's like you just found it very powerful what James was talking about. It sounds like you can sort of identify with it too, that you're sort of in the moment and 
you get it touches something happens that touches something you just kind of get overwhelmed and triggered by it and then you have a bit of distance and you're saying well you know, it wasn't that big of a deal or you know you have a bit more perspective so uh it sounds like it's really you're then understanding what he's what he's saying yeah it's kind of like called the 24 hours later it used to be and then it got shortened to maybe six hours 12 hours or six hours later um and it's like a state specific consciousness where you're in where you're in this whatever primal trigger and then it's not like it's the amygdala but it's not the cerebral cortex um and so i often have to take a pause and i have to write out what i'm going to say to someone and just think well is that what i'm going to want to be you know i want to lash out to that person i they hurt me or they did something and i'm like this is so wrong and then, or sometimes I will say something that's more, I mean, it's, it's watered down. But then afterwards I'm like, hey, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe, you know, in the moment I, I wasn't thinking. Um, yeah. yeah, you're really looking at that aspect where <clears throat> you're in the moment, you know, you, something happens, you get triggered. Uh, and, you know, you, you're, you're kind of looking at what you could have done, you know, maybe you could have, you know, taken a pause, maybe, you, and afterwards, maybe you write things out, but how do you kind of deal with that, uh, that trigger and that those, you know, that maybe that even that pain and that, that you had it in, in that moment. So you're trying right. to sort of navigate that space. Um, definitely trying not to, um, I mean, I'll write it out and realize, no, that's pretty like the blame, shame, judgment thing is just not going to help matters, um, you know, or it, it'll come out as sarcasm in my voice. That's not going to help matters. It doesn't matter if I say something nice. If my tone is like sarcastic, someone else is going to pick up on that. So I have to take a deep breath and pause, just take a deep breath. And, and trust me, there have been times when I really wanted to lay into that person, you know, they deserve that. They're just being heinous. You know, I'm just like, I want them to feel pain. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, it's, like, not, it's like you've yeah. been, you've been, you feel hurt, you feel in pain. And, you know, you're just, how do you sort of navigate it? You can try to control yourself, but then your sarcasm, it kind of that pain leaks out in sarcasm. And you know that they're going to hear, hear that. And then on one hand, you just want to lash out and, you know, kind of attack them. And you're just, Kind of how do, how do you sort of navigate that in a constructive way? Maybe maybe you're looking for a more constructive way of. Yeah. I'm well, and in retrospect too, like my other the other strategy would be just to try to smooth things over in the moment, which is not really that, that viable. Because I actually regret doing that as well. Because I'll definitely feel all the anger, fear, and all that. You know, if someone's just been like a, a situation with, um, you know, my brother, my my brother um with his girlfriend and she was acting out badly so um and it's like i was just trying to minimize and smooth it over actually maybe would have been helpful to to do it and say hey i'm curious like why did you do this i mean like i'm curious like this happened do you want to just maybe explain a little bit more about this i mean that i think might have been more helpful like hey you did the social taboo that goes against our culture I mean, I, I wanted to say that, hey, do you know that what you just did goes against pretty much every single religion and culture, and it's probably morally offensive, and it's about the worst thing you can possibly ever do, aside from murder. So, um, and, and, you know, so tell me, how is that okay? You know, that's uh, what I really want to say. Yeah, okay, so that's the time, but what I'm hearing is, uh, so what, like with your, sounds like your, boy, your, your brother's uh, girlfriend, that there was something that happened, and you're, you're kind of like looking at how you could have responded and you're thinking, well, one way of responding is just to kind of ask for more, kind of uh, get more information about what is behind that. But then on another hand is you also want to be able to say, hey, do you know that this is not socially acceptable? This goes against all mores. And <laughs> so you're just kind of thinking of how to sort of, you know, ad address those type of issues. Thank you. I really okay. feel hurt. This is so okay. bad. Uh, speak to James then. Uh, listening, Edwin. Well, yeah, so for these, it's, it's interesting that these dynamics is uh, 
there's a, I see sort of the empathic, mutual empathic listening is the way of addressing these moments, right? But it takes a lot of structure around these moments to create that, that empathic structure, right? You got to have the agreement that people are willing to do an empathy circle. It helps if people have practiced, you know, empathic listening, you know, so it, it takes a whole culture around these moments of feeling like your identity yourself is is kind of being crushed <laughs> i know the feeling too it's like <laughs> so um um these moments that are difficult moments you 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 think that the solution is empathy but that structures are required to make it possible to get into that empathic space or at least they're helpful to get into that empathic space um to make it possible yeah, it's like that's where a, a culture of empathy is needed. It's not like, hey, me is this, in, I think that's one of the problems with NVC. It's like, oh, it's me as an individual going for my individual needs and how do I get my individualistic, narcissistic, self-centered needs met? And I think it totally misses the cultural aspect. We need a culture where this, the, this value of empathy is sort of valued sort of by the culture in, in, and it's a cultural norm. Um, so it's more than just about one's own needs and getting those met, which is kind of narcissistic and individualistic. Um, and you see, it's kind of, that's a culture of pr problem within NVC communities. Mm -hmm. Um, but instead to find the, to connect to the cultural element of needs that is, um, where we're not just think considering ourselves. Yeah, it's like the culture needs empathy, right? It's like the, it has to be, you know, structurally uh, in everybody's mind in the way the, the culture is organized so that, uh, you know, so Sarah's sister, uh, uh, her, her brother and, you know, that they would know, oh, we have a conflict, like, we need to do an empathy circle, right? And they have experience with it and that, and then like now, Sarah is sharing that experience and I'm sure it's kind of helping. It's like she probably doesn't feel so alone with it. And it's probably a little bit of healing, bit of support uh, to be talking about it after the fact too. So, you know, you, you, you got to build a whole culture, a whole container around these, th these moments. Yeah, so you're thinking that Sarah may be benefiting from bringing it into this circle space some healing and understanding that comes, um, but it's um, maybe also helpful. M more is required where um, containers are created around uh, many of these spaces or relationships where there is um, a lack of understanding. Yeah, so with her brother and her, his girlfriend, yeah, they could be doing empathy circles with each other, right, on an ongoing basis. So they'd be learning the skills. You know, Sarah could be doing a family empathy circle, you know, and doing it before the conflict happens. You know, we need to find ways of engaging people in empathy circles before the conflict happens so we can, you know, everybody can build trust in the process or in, in, that, in the process and the whole mindset behind it. So Sarah could be doing empathy circles with some of these family members and it can, she or people in, the, in these similar circumstances can invite the empathy circle, invite structure and empathic exchange before the conflict happens preventatively so that it makes it easier, the transition uh, makes it easier. Yeah, we need to and build trust in sort of the, the empathic process and the mindset that's behind it, right? There's a uh, underlying mindset is you know, I'm willing to listen and hear you out, but hey, how about you listen and hear me out too? So kind of that, that quality of mutuality, uh, you know, and you kind of develop trust in that. And yeah, and I'm like totally shocked. I, I would have thought it would be inherent in NVC. And I'm just saying, wow, NVC, I mean, these are like experienced 10, 15 year uh, trainers who are not like grounded in this mindset. So I don't know, I my mind going all over the place here, but there's something missing in the whole NVC. Uh, just that these trainers are not even seeing that. Just, I would have thought they'd see it. They just see it, you know, but. So yeah, and that's time. It, um, it is stunning to you 
that people who have been doing work, similar work for 10, 15 years, uh, professionally, all the time, are it, it's somehow something is not clicking, and um, there isn't there isn't a kind of just go to tendency where people create spaces for empathic exchange. It's it's just it's not what happens. Yeah, there's some awareness missing, and I'm trying to put my finger on what is that awareness, and how do we sort of explain that awareness, and how do we kind of get buy in and yeah into that awareness, and with that I feel heard some awareness missing and what could we do to create more awareness, at least in our spaces. So there's buy-in from them or others. All right, Bill, would you listen to me? Sure, James. Thanks. Yeah, that's a challenge that Edwin makes that I appreciate and find myself struggling to live up to. I think it's a really great point. Um, it's absolutely, I, I can see it would have absolutely been helpful if I could have found the resources and the creativity to go to this call organizer and preventatively have a conversation with her about how I'm concerned that disagreement is blocked from coming into the call series. So you were considering, you were uh, reflecting what uh, Edwin said about uh, a, a cultural awareness of dialogue and the importance of dialogue and listening to each other and that you wish you had, had uh, earlier on the capacity to understand that and had a like of a pre-discussion with the organizer to address some of your issues your issues about disagreement yeah yeah it's not so much the understanding i mean i've agreed with that for a long time but it's somehow it's finding the creativity to actually perform that challenge in each of these particular relationships Mm -hmm. So the challenge then is to make, um, uh, to be aware of the uh, need for communication and, uh, and I'm reading in, but I think mutual respect in order to let people hear each other. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's something around how the, let's say the structure like the empathy circle um, really, it supports us in doing that. And, but like you had said before, life is not lived in an empathy circle. So there's also some skill required leaving the empathy circle, but taking the knowledge and, and principles into these individual relationships. Right. So the structure of the empathy circle supports this sort of like, you know, um, supportive dialogue or uh, effective dialogue. But then the key is to take internalize those things in, that we experience in the empathy circle and then apply them to other relationships in our life. Yeah. And I, I think this is really key, but I, like I am aware that the mo for me, the moments of conflict with you have always happened outside of an empathy circle. And it's precisely because the training wheels or the structure is not there to support mm. us. And, and so in that, um, liminal space, and it's not just with you, I get, in, I get into trouble in liminal spaces where it's not clear to me what the expectations are. Okay, so you were referring to your uh, conflict with me and, um, and the fact that in the empathy circle it seems to work okay, but that the problem has come outside of the em empathy circle and you were, used the word liminal, which I assume means out in everyday society. Is oh, no, I mean, I mean it by in between, in between. In between, space. okay, I get it. So liminal means that there's no real structure. There's, you know, it's, it, it's unclear what the structure is. So therefore, <laughs> it's more pre, um, uh, prevalent to miscommunications and misunderstandings. Yeah, it's like the two minutes before the empathy circle starts or something. It's like that space somehow. And it's, it's again, it's not just with you, but I, so um, in, uh, in the call that I've been planning and creatively organizing lately, I've been creating this segment, which is like the structure of the, the, the structured call ends. And then there's this five minute period before we get off the phone. And it's just a way to like transition between, yeah, okay, we had this structure, the structure's great. It helps us. Mm -hmm. And now we're going into structureless land and like, mm -hmm. let's just, you know, 
uh, take a minute to recognize that. So you're talking about a call, a practice of listening that you're, you've uh, designed or you know, implemented um, and that there's certain structure, but then you've also added like five minutes at the end where it's not going to be the structure, but, but hopefully that same understanding and effective communication will carry through even without the structure. Right. It's a, it's a beautiful moment, actually. I've experienced it as a beautiful moment to somehow just make a cognitive connection to, oh, in this space, without the structure, what would it look like to stay with some of the spirit that we just had created? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you really find it's very touching and beautiful when the, when the, um, the rules kind of come off, but people um, really engage each other respectfully and supportively. Yes, and that's my time. I feel hurt. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, we're going around here. Uh, how are we on time, Edwin? Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. All right, so I'll speak to Sarah. I'm listening. Okay. Um, so um, I have to say that I've enjoyed this uh, empathy circle, and I will say that uh, I don't accept uh, James's uh, idea of conflict or something like that, or his judgments on me. Um, that, um, uh, but I really have enjoyed, uh, you know, being with him in an empathy circle, and hope that you know, as long as we have this structure together. Um, that, you know, it's fine with me. Uh, I was not, it did not take, uh, I've never said that I um, never, I don't want to be in a um, circle with James. What I've said before is that I don't seek to be in a circle with James and I don't seek not to be in a circle. And that's been consistent since I've ever um, met James. Um, you know, again, uh, I, my capacity is reduced when I'm insulted and I feel that other people are being hurt verbally. And um, that's not to me what the circle's about and outside of the rules of the circle. I'll stop there. Mm. So you're clarifying for James that you're mm. enjoying being in the empathy circle with him. Mm -hmm. You're also, and you're also recognizing this is a, a structured time, but you're clarifying that you've never said you didn't want to be in a circle. What mm -hmm. you have said is, I don't, see, I don't seek to be or not to be in a circle. Mm -hmm. And you're adding a further clarification, which is your concern is that your capacity is diminished when insulted or when other people are hurt. Yeah, I care about the people I meet. And, I, and if they're mistreated or if I'm mistreated, um, I have feelings, I have strong feelings about that. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. You're emphasizing a core value of caring about other people mm -hmm. and, and concerned about how they are treated or mistreated. Right. And in James's description of our interaction, he rarely mentions that we've spent, I guess we said at least five hours. Well, we had a, a regular call on a Saturday, uh, which was fairly, sometimes it went into structure, sometimes it didn't. And uh, and I, I believe we both agreed in a, in a friend that it was convivial. It was, you know, it was fine. Uh, James is an intelligent man. And, uh, you know, he always, you know, uh, I find his, con his, uh, his conversation could be very stimulating. I'll stop there. Mm. So you're, you're really reflecting mm -hmm. on the imp importance of all the positive connections and times you've had. Um, I want to emphasize that, that mm -hmm. they were kind of vivial mm -hmm. and also emphasizing that James is intelligent and, and interaction is in engaging. Right. And um, that, uh, you know, and still there have been other issues where I've been, um, what I would say, I consider to be mistreated and, um, and that's not okay with me. Hmm. So you're really emphasizing how the emphasis on the times mm -hmm. you've been mistreated. Right. Is that and, okay? Right. And then James tends to set himself up as the judge. We're in conflict, but never, I didn't say, or I'm a 
bullshit detector, uh, which is a good job if you can get it, but I didn't vote for James to be the bullshit detector. I'd like to think I'm the bullshit detector. And of course, that's where miscommunications can come through. Um, you know, everybody wants that job. Um, so, uh, so what I would hope going forward is that uh, in these Friday circles, um, you know, uh, again, uh, I hope that, you know, we can be together and not together, I'm talking about James and myself, as this is my idea of how to resolve what James has termed a conflict and what I consider something uh, different. Um, and that we can, um, that both within outside the circle, demonstrate respect and, uh, and then we experience ourselves in these circles and, uh, you know, and then grow, both, both of us, you know, certainly I would like to, you know, improve my capacity. That's always um, a goal of mine. Mm. Mm. So you're clarifying a number of things. One is, mm that you, you also were looking at the job of bullshit detector mm -hmm. and that, you know, I mentioned, wait, is James self appointing himself as in that job description? Wait, you mm -hmm. want that too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you were concerned by saying that was their judgment on some people on the empathy circle or the organizers. Um, and, but you're feeling there wasn't really conflict when that was named and there was too much, there was a focus on conflict when there were so many conviv convivial times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, sir. I feel fully heard. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, that might be a little shorter, maybe four minutes yeah. or so. That's, that's okay. Go ahead. Um, so James, can you listen? Yes, listening. Thank you. So I'm taking all of this in. Um, yeah, it's 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 these these empathy circles. You know, I've I've been in different ones and groups that are outside of Edwin's, and I can definitely. <laughs> there are times when I'm like, oh my god, you know, like I'm appreciative of of the structure and the circle. Um, because it's, it helps um, with conversation skills. And I'm really appreciative. You're really appreciative of the, the circles, the people, the structure. It helps you with conversation skills, these circles and circles outside the Friday ones. I'm hanging up my phone. My phone's going on for full mm -hmm. transparency. I'm hanging it up. Otherwise, mm -hmm. my internet disconnects. Okay, just again, letting you guys know that was what was happening. Sorry about that. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to um, refer back to what Bill said about um, he cares about people and doesn't like it when they're um, mistreated or I guess called names. You're bringing back that Bill said uh, he doesn't like to be mistreated or for other people to be mistreated and called names. Yeah, I'm thinking that would be like my first tendency is there's a lot of things I want to call people. <laughs> there's I've, I've got I've got a whole laundry list, you know, and I have to pop put a pause button half the time um, where I want to jump and I want to I want to say so much and someone's like completely pissing me off. And it's even happened. Where, where I want to name it and I have to step back and I have to just, even if I feel I'm so justified, I have to step back and it's hard. So when you get really pissed off, you also want to call people names. You have lots of things you want to say to people that um, you need to pause and it's very difficult, but you need to pause and pull yourself back from doing so. Yeah, uh, I'm. It's it's on so many levels. Like, will what I say hurt this person? Am am I judging this person? Um, probably, yeah. <laughs> I am judging that person in the moment. I am so judging them, um, and 
Um, and then I'm like witnessing to all my judgments, which are so huge. Um, and I have to put the pause button. So you're asking, are, is, it, is it that you're judging this person? And then you laughed and said, yeah, you are judging this person. And that's why you're putting the pause button on. It's really hard. I, I, I can self-regulate to a point. Um, and then I ended up like yesterday writing out, well, what are the benefits of it, you know, like I, I actually had an issue with like people in a, in a group talking for nine minutes or 12 minutes straight. I had an issue with that and it was really hard for me. And so I, but I phrased it like, Hey, can you just share what are the benefits? You know, uh, I mean, what are the benefits? Honestly, cause I'm thinking, Oh my God, trust me. Like I'm thinking, ew, who wants to just like, someone's just going to unload for nine minutes. What's the fun in that? <laughs> And so that's four minutes, but I'll get that. Um, you're, um, you're able to self-regulate up to a point. And then maybe when somebody goes on too long or you're, you're, you have anger, or like you said, somebody's going on for 12 minutes, you're asking what's the point in regulating for that whole time or that much? Like what's, or what's the fun in connecting to someone when they're just, just talking for a, too long well i don't tell it to their face i i i mean but it's it's and i can identify um it's because my mom does monologues so i identify the trigger i know the trigger and it's not about that person it's about my mom doing monologues for half an hour you have a connect you have a family history connection to why that's so triggering for you because your mm -hmm. mom does it mm -hmm. and i, I see five seconds late left so i just wanted to say thank you everyone Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All righty. Welcome back, everyone. If you know the drill, the last uh, 10 minutes or so, we just go around and uh, just give any sort of a final debrief. It's sort of our transition between the empathy circle and real life, <laughs> which is something that came up in, in our group. Uh, so uh, just share how it went. I'll, I'll start. Um, yeah, it was good. It was good. To James is, you know, we have some issues sometimes with James and it was great uh, to, for everyone to sort of talk with him and uh, I thought everything went, uh, the power of the empathy circle was revealed again. <laughs> so I appreciate that and I, I really enjoyed it and uh, so that was my part. Bill, I'll just choose people here. Process. Sure. I, I also enjoyed it too as well. Uh, I enjoyed everyone in the circle, including James. And uh, I think it's just really uh, brought home to me that we need to follow the structure of the empathy circle, how important that is. And that kind of sets us up right. That's it. Uh, thanks, Claudine. Keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we, uh, I think, connected. Um, I feel, I feel educated. I feel, um, I feel like this did its, did its work. It's, it's a, it's an ongoing thing and it, and it, it did its work in, in the face of resistance and um, potential conflagrations and stuff. It still feels um, it's innate value to me. Um, and I, I come away with a sense of, um, of empowerment. I do. Oh, great. Thanks. Uh, Ibisan? I'm going to give you a whole year, Edwin. You're going to, I can have you a special, a special tu yeah, tutoring of the pronunciation. I'm going to have to write it down or something, or maybe I'll record it. I'll re it. What? But anyway, I said you can see it. It's if the sum with the M at the end, like mother. Oh, did, okay. If it, if it sum. <laughs> it's like, I'm sorry. It's okay. Oh, I said I'd give you a whole year. Say, say it again, and I'm going to go back to the recording and just keep practicing and practicing it. 
if the sum. Okay. Um, and I think that's how you pronounce it, but uh, I've had a, a very enriching, a very educational and a very, um, I'm feeling very empowered. There were, uh, there was a lot of uh, emotions. Um, and after last week, I was particularly very uh, grateful for being in an all women's group, which somehow <laughs> felt really nice, uh, which is where I kind of literally began my sharing from and then, yeah, and then everything just evolved from there. Uh, and I really do see the power of these empathy circles. And I think it's my learning. Um, I can see this uh, even as a role as a facilitator, but beyond that, I can, I really recognize my role as a speaker more and more weirdly enough, which is amazing because, you know, uh, after years of being a psychotherapist and listening, I'm like, wow, there is so much power when I speak. This could just be a whole new profession coming up. And it all began somewhere here. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, uh, James. Uh, I'm glad that the empathy circle can deal with even me. That's encouraging. And um, it was a joke, but never mind. So, um, yeah, it, I had a good time with, with, with Bill and uh, Sarah and Edwin and... Um, there is a lot of work to do in this world with rela in relation to building a culture of empathy. Um, and I'm glad to do some of it with, uh, with all of you. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Um, everyone was very engaging and spoke about very real authentic things that were very important that often are not talked about in our society and I'm appreciative of everyone in the circle including James. Thanks. Uh, Sophia? Yeah, we didn't talk so much about building a culture of empathy but we talked uh, a lot about motherhood and how it had has affected us all. Um, yeah, I had an interesting experience because I, I felt misunderstood by someone and I noticed how my nervous system kind of like, I was getting more and more triggered. Uh, but when it finally became my turn to speak and so I could clear it up, I kind of like noticed how it went down when I felt heard and um, even even just saying kind of like we we are going past time and I'm feeling annoyed because of that just by voicing it I felt how I my nervous system kind of like calmed down and that was a really interesting experience so yeah I had a new experience mm. Mm, thanks uh uh, Maureen? Yes, it was, um, I think maybe the fact it was an all women group, I don't know. It was intergenerational. I found that very um, enriching. I felt um, there was a certain kind of liberation in the group. And as somebody said already, it was uh, deeply emotional. It was my first time to facilitate. So I found myself, as uh, already said, trying to balance the, uh, the empathy circle, the empathy circle um, what is it, structure, you know, appreciating that we need to keep the structure uh, while at the same time, when there was a moment of deep emotion, trying to allow it to get expressed. So, and how that might have affected the whole, um, the whole, all the people in the circles, trying to hold all of that, you know. But it was a great experience, and I must say we went much deeper in emotions than I've ever been in any of these circles. Mm. 
I came in with my Extinction Rebellion hat on to talk about uh, seeds and grain and food and all the rest of it. And it turned out to be something completely different. Mm. But it was, it was like how enriching. Well, great. Well, thanks for uh, facilitating, Maureen. Uh, and uh, so next, in, in half an hour, we have the facilitator support group. If anyone's wanting to do empathy circle facilitation and you have some projects on your mind that you can come and share those and, and be heard about it, you can check our events calendar for upcoming empathy cafes. I think everybody probably has that link. Uh, it's on Facebook and James is holding one. Are you still holding yours, James? Yeah, I'll still hold it 10 to 11.30 Eastern time in mm -hmm. the circle tomorrow. Uh, if it's done, I'm, no, I don't know, I'm afraid to even call on you if I'm gonna. <laughs> uh, I couldn't, uh, I would have liked to actually attend it uh, last Saturday, James, but I couldn't find it. Uh, probably I'm one of those crazy technophobic, I couldn't find it on Facebook. So if you could just post me a link, maybe I don't know how to do this, but I, I would like the, to really attend the session. I'll put the uh, calendar in. Um, calendar page. This is on Facebook, so uh, you can go there. You should see all the upcoming events. Uh, should be there. If you just want to double check that you're able to see that. Um. So the, the, all the events are listed. Uh, the, this one, the facilitators group, the extra um. principles, and then the Empathy Circle on Exclusion, Empathy Circle Facilitator Training Sign Up. So those are the upcoming events. Right, okay. So this is the one Empathy Circle on Exclusion series, right? Yes. Uh -huh. All right, thank you. Oh my God, okay. Yeah, I have to remember to keep the stage open for tomorrow, otherwise it may just get yeah. lost. <laughs> That's, that's a good one to uh, bookmark uh, this because then you can have all the events are listed there. Uh, oh, I'm so, really okay. tired. Yeah, okay, that's the end it's too. The so. I, I pronounced it right. It's the sun. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye, everyone. If it's sun. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you want to, does Maureen want to debrief? I don't know. Oh, do you want to debrief? Hang in there for a minute, just a quick yeah, debrief sure. on how that went yeah. for you. Thank you. Yeah, I just <laughs> yeah, yes, it was. Uh, no, yeah, before was you, just, no, before you leave, I just want to say thank you so much, and Maureen, my sympathies to you, but I thought you did an amazing job. Just want you to know. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So, how was that with the facilitation? Yes, the clock went, I say the clock went okay, really. That was my biggest worry coming into it. But then, as I said in my other speech there, uh, Bill, it was really, um, it was emotional. Mm. So I had to balance there between one person who really was feeling, um, feeling who needed that time, Mm -hmm. And then maybe another person who kind of overplayed it. Mm -hmm. So the third person then in the group, I could even know by the body language, this mm. person is not happy, you know? Mm. Right. So I could see that. So I certainly learned that to distinguish between the person who really needed the time and the person who actually didn't need the time. Yeah. Yeah. Extra. Tough. yeah. Otherwise than that, I think it went okay. Are you saying? Oh, sorry. Are you saying that uh, someone went longer than their turn, and somebody else was sort of objecting to that or upset about it, or and how much did they go over their time? Um. Yes, one person. I was not worried about how much she went over her time once. That might have been okay. But I think the real trouble where I fell down and the other person then got really annoyed was when uh, the, the, the other lady didn't need to have that extra time and took it and got it and was difficult to maneuver, was difficult to deal with anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in spite uh, of my clock going up. Uh, how about carriage. how much do they go over? How, how, how much oh, they... two minutes maybe. Oh, okay. That's not... Yeah, certainly. Mm -hmm. it, was, yeah, it was needed once, I think, but after that. Yeah, it's sort of balancing people's need to be heard with fairness mm -hmm. too. Right. So, yes, and you don't even know if people really need to be heard or not. That's the problem. It's like people need to be heard and you can't tell if they're needing to be heard. So, you know what I mean? That's what the, the fairness aspect is. And it sounded like somebody, but anyway, that you, you got to kind of, yeah, balance that. So I don't know. Yeah, I was really impressed by your, your, um, your uh, mindset and, and your balancing. That, that is the difficult thing. It, it's like, uh, does everybody get to feel heard? And that's different for different people at different times. And that... I don't think we'll always ever get it right perfectly, um, but I really was very impressed by actually how you framed it and how you're looking at it. And, um, you know, I, I just think that's great because that's what it is. It's not a, a cookie cutter type of thing. It's a question of trying to listen, see the process, and then also manage it at the same time, which is, which is a lot of balls in the air. Um, and, and, and it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it takes some time, you know, it takes some time to do it. But what I was getting is that people had a really great time and yeah. it was, you know, you did give them that experience. So I, I appreciate you, Melanie. Thank you very much. So, okay. I won't yeah, be attending the next session. You what? Oh, you will not. Yeah. I will not, no, because okay. I'm on in the morning with Sydney, right. Australia. So. Oh yeah, okay. I'm gonna be there too. I get a five minute. I'm gonna be doing a little pre presentation. So, um, all right. Okay. okay. Well, great. Take Good care, night. everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night.